Hello Bike Geeks! From weight to wheels, price to performance, we are here to take a close look at bicycles so you can make an educated decision when selecting your next bike. In today's video, we're taking a look at the new 2024 Marin Headlands 2. This is a new color and a new spec on a Headlands frame that is now in its fifth or sixth year. Um, and it is still as relevant and front of the pack geometry as it ever was. So today we look at the Marin Headlands 2. To start this video, let's start with a few numbers. Of course, an important number on this is going to be price. Our bike shop, Bike Bros, is in Canada. So our Canadian price on this is $39.99 Canadian dollars. If you were in the States, you would expect to see this in a shop for about $29.99. This is one of two different versions of the Headlands. There's also a cheaper one, the Headlands 1, and that one is $33.99 in Canada or $25.99 in the States. Weight on this, this is a size 54, just so you know what uh, size I'm weighing, is 22 and a half pounds. And what else can I tell you? Oh, differences between the Headlands 1 and Headlands 2 are centered around two main things. This one, the Headlands 2, comes with a dropper post and the amount of drop on the post will depend on the frame size as well as the change on the Headlands 1. It has a GRX uh, one by drive train with, uh, what did they say here? 11 speed, 1142 cassette on the back there. Whereas this one here, the 2024 version of the Headlands 2, now has a SRAM 12 speed Apex drivetrain with a cassette ranging from 10 to 52 teeth on the rear there. I had a quick look and for those people who are worried about having a one by drivetrain on their gravel bike, this bike now has virtually the identical uh, percentage range of gears to the equivalent Apex two by, uh, what do they have? A two by 11 or two by 12 Apex. And that one, in both cases, they are about a 520% gear range. So, on these bikes, which are built specifically to be one by, because you just can't be mounting a front derailleur on a shaped seat tube like this. So this bike, designed specifically around one by, has as broad a range of gears as basically a gravel bike with a two by setup. Now, what are the downsides? The downsides are, um, in my mind, ne negligible because I'm a huge fan of one by. But essentially what happens with all of your gears being in those 12 teeth there is you're going to have more noticeable steps between your gears. As a plus, I mean, I quite often when I'm using my shifters, I'm uh, going by a couple gears at a time, I find, in a lot of roly-poly kind of situations. So those steps and gears don't matter to me. Where it will matter is for those people who are in training mode and they're trying to stick within a very a uh, small range of cadence, that is the one time that you'll be noticing those steps between your gears is when you're trying to stay at, say, exactly 90 RPM and not more than uh, two or three RPM more or less. This one by gearing um, won't work as well for that, but for everything else, in my opinion, one by is awesome. You're going to have less noise from your front chain ring uh, with chains rubbing on front derailleurs like they inevitably do. Less adjustment required as far as getting your front derailleur to work and we all know that front derailleurs suck and they are the or were the hardest thing to get working flawlessly on a lot of drop bar, drop bar bikes specifically. And then in addition on one by we get these nice complete tooth pro profile teeth with these narrow wide chain rings. So we get much better chain retention. We get to use clutched derailleurs. Like in this case, we have a very, very strong spring in here. And 
to give us a way to make it possible for removing a wheel in the case of a flat tire or anything, we get a little button right here and that is what we can press so that we basically get a whole pile of chain slack when we're changing wheels and then right back to a full chain tension setup. So those are numbers. We also have numbers like this frame is designed to max out at 45C tires. In the past, we've seen headlands coming with anything from, I think, 38s to 40s for tires. This 2024 model is now coming with 44s and they are using uh, every bit of seat post clearance there, seat tube clearance and chain stay clearance. So they are certainly getting close to that 45 C, which is what Marin says is the maximum tire size. Looking down at these tires certainly does give you a different feeling from what you would have gotten in the past as this bike over the last two generations of mostly changing colors and now this one getting a big change with this gearing change and tire change. This is, I would say, reflecting the attitude out of a lot of riders um, as they accept larger and larger tires, um, as they realize that larger and larger tires don't necessarily mean slower speeds or lower efficiency. So I look forward, uh, some of you may know that I have ridden two headlands in a row and I'm going to get one of these. So I will be, have been on the same bike for the last five years, essentially on the same frame and fork. Um, just changing the models with the color changes and now with this big switch to SRAM and I'm looking forward to riding on these 44C tires and seeing how much that adds to the um, race car feeling that you can corner like crazy on asphalt and get a little bit of a smoother, um, more confident ride in gravel. What else can I touch on with numbers here. So we know that we're at about a 520% gear range or exactly a 520% gear range on this. To compare to the Headlands 1 which has that 1142 GRX one by drivetrain that has a 381% uh, gear range. So you are getting a massive increase here. One criticism I would say in regards to the gear range on this Headlands 2 is while it changed from that 1142 up to this 1052, um, one thing I would have loved to have seen is that the front chain ring actually stepped up in size a bit. This is still uh, working with a 40 tooth chain ring and I believe that's what I had on my previous version. So most of the gains you're getting on here are at the low range or your hill climbing gears. The only difference at the high range is that our small tooth on our cassette has crept down from 11 teeth to 10 teeth, so that is a roughly 10% gain in your high range, but I would have loved to have seen this go to say a 42, if not maybe even a 44 tooth on the front, then you would probably find that this thing would only spin out at, I would guess, 60 kilometers an hour. I think I used my previous headlands to get an idea that you could pretty much get to about 50 kilometers or 30 miles an hour before you really started feeling like you were spinning out your legs. Um, that's my only criticism. On the upside, you're gonna get awesome hill climbing. So if you happen to have steeps in your area or if you are riding in single track that gets into steeper stuff, you are going to love this new setup. So. That was a whole bunch of numbers, and now we're gonna get into some of the details about the specifications on this bike, which some of it is gonna be a little bit of uh, talking about the same thing again as far as drivetrain, but I'm gonna go into detail on that, on the brakes, uh, talk a little bit about the fact that we have double tap shifters on here now rather than the Shimano style drop bar shifters. And once again, our goal on these Bike Bros videos is by the end, you'll understand this particular model more and hopefully this segment of bikes a little bit better by learning what some of these details actually mean in person.
So going into some of these specs, and I'll do it quickly because a lot of this you can look up, but I do want to at least tell you things that may not be obvious or clear if you're new to researching gravel bikes. We've got a 12-speed drivetrain, 10 to 52 teeth, massive range of gears on the back here. This is the new SRAM Apex. This is new for 2024. Um, so this is pretty much a gravel specific, one by specific setup that we're looking at on this bike. We have aluminum rims, 21 millimeters wide internally, 20, 21 millimeters tall. That's the depth of that rim profile. They're disc specific rims. They are on Marin branded hubs, which means they're essentially a no name hub, but Marin tends to have pretty good hubs in their bikes. We won't have crazy high engagement, but I'm, I'm not uh, upset with the kind of engagement that this has. So this is a pretty decent engagement hub for being a no-name hub. As I mentioned, those 21 mil wide rims um, in combination with these V-Tire G-Sport 700 by 44, these are a tubeless um, ready tire design. So when Marin ships these bikes, they ship them to us with tubes in here, so that is just a regular valve, but um, with a little bit of work and sealant, you would be able to set these tires up tubeless, which would basically allow you to ride your tires a little bit softer without the fear of getting pinch flats. That soft tire is gonna give you amazing traction, a little bit of bump absorption, and for many people who are used to the old days where drop bar bikes were riding, say, 100 PSI in their tires, um, they're slowly starting to learn that a softer tire up to a point isn't actually slower. Uh, there's a bunch of videos out there on YouTube. I would urge you to look them up, but there are actual tire engineer type people who work with Tour de France teams. And when they're doing testing with tires, what they will often find when talking to the athletes is that the optimal sort of power to speed uh, happens at a tire pressure when the racers start saying, hey, this is starting to feel slow. And that is often where they're actually getting the most efficiency out of the pedal, pedal power that they're putting in. Going back to details on this frame, and I should point out, so this is a full carbon frame and fork, 12 millimeter through axles, front and rear. We of course like to see through axles because it gives us a really solid way of connecting our bike and our frame, not just a way of holding one in place, but actually unifying those as sort of one part, the axle and the frame. Um, so we've got the 12 millimeter, we've got the carbon. In days past, the Headlands and Marin's Gestalt X were almost like the aluminum and the um, carbon version, the Gestalt X being the aluminum, of a very similar frame concept. We have now, since the Marine Gestalt X has got really, really radical with being a progressive frame geometry, that now doesn't stand true anymore. The Gestalt X is a very, very progressive um, off-road ready sort of a drop bar bike, while this is starting to look a bit more like its contemporaries from, say, Giant or Specialized. I just looked at some of the uh, geometry numbers that we see on things like the Revolt or Diverge. Um, this bike is starting to fit in with those bikes. When this bike first came out, it was noticeably um, more progressive than those other companies. So this is the advantage of Marin having been so far ahead of the game is the fact that they can now be on their fifth year, fifth or sixth with this identical frame design, yet it is absolutely up to date, nothing dated at all about the geometry, and there are some standout things as we talk about geometry on here. For me, I would say a big standout, which this cutout in the seat tube is your one hint, is the fact that these still have one of the shortest chain stays on a gravel bike uh, able to accept up to 45C tires out there. What that's gonna do for you is that gives you a rear end that resembles a road race bike a little bit more than a lot of the uh, gravel bikes that are out there. So I wouldn't say that longer or shorter is better or worse. I would say that it at least gives you a reason um, to love this bike if you're not into that 
uh, really long, really stable. If you're wanting a little bit more agility out of your bike and a little bit more of what feels like a bike that wants to sprint a little bit more, a short rear end certainly gives that to you. Uh, my previous life in drop bars was many, many years putting on many road miles. And so I have absolutely loved this bike because even a gravel bike, gravel ride for myself is going to be at least 50% asphalt. And I, I love the efficiency. Um, I still feel like um, I'm as efficient as those old road days on a 16 pound uh, road bike. Um, but I can just go so many more places and still have that really sporty feeling. So I just wanted to touch on that a little bit to do with the frame. Um, other things to do with the frame on here, we have things like this little replaceable fender mounting arch. You can take that little thing that says 86 off. It is just bolted on with these tiny little Allen bolts here. Um, they make it re removable, so if you're not going to run fenders, you can just have that little bit of a clean look of having no bridge at the top of your seat stays. We have some things that show that they are trying to build in a lot, a lot of adaptability beyond this being a raceable gravel bike. It is also a um, racy bike packing type of a gravel bike too. So as I mentioned, you've got a spot to mount your fenders there. You have a spot here to mount a rear uh, rack, something like a, an old man mountain divide rack, say. Um, you've got the brazon threaded mount down here uh, for those sorts of things as well. We have a multitude of uh, threaded inserts on the frame. So we have stuff on top here right behind your stem for a little feed bag. You could get a custom made frame bag made and use these three mounts on the bottom. And then they're giving you multiple uh, water bottle cage mounts here, which on my own, I ride a 58. And so I'm able to get away with uh, two big bottles on my frame and using one of those sets of bottle cage mounts to put a tool kit on my bike. Uh, and in addition, down in the poo splash zone, you have another set of water bottle mounts down there. So you really could pack a lot of stuff on this. And if you're looking for that real adventuring drop bar bike, um, this is a, an awesome way to go. Moving forward from that drivetrain stuff I mentioned back there, we do have these apex cranks on here. Um, with that 40 tooth one piece narrow wide chain ring on there. This is all attached to the bike with a threaded external bottom bracket. So for some people who really have a hate on for press fit bottom bracket, you don't have to worry about that. This is threaded. We have some nice internal cable routing on this bike. It's quite clean. Uh, the little rubber ports up here and then no ports, just a cable coming out of the carbon on your seat stay here for your rear derailleur and then your rear brake line coming out of the chain stay there as well. Uh, quite a clean, clean look. Um, everything else about the bike, very smooth, doing the aesthetic of carbon quite beautifully. Uh, as we move forward to the fork, we again have three cargo mounts on the fork as well as a lower fender mount on here. So once again, if you were choosing to put a front bag rack on here, that would be useful for you. You also have a threaded hole on the crown of your fork here that will help you to mount either a fender or a rack on there as well. As I mentioned with this particular bike, you do get a dropper seat post on here. Um, it's funny, from the first model of the Headlands 2 that came out, we brought in a couple and they really felt like dogs because so many people in the gravel world at that point thought of a dropper post as the answer to the question that nobody asked. And now, as every time a person buys a bike with a dropper post on that, we're going to be sure to have two or three more people come in more willing to be excited about a dropper post because they realize from talking to those friends with droppers that they're actually a surprisingly useful thing on a gravel bike. For myself, I find my, my saddle going up and down quite a bit as soon as I'm off uh, pavement just to lower my weight if I'm in sketch, sketchy gravel or riding single track. 
And then when I'm just using my bike to blast around town, whenever, whenever I'm in congested areas with other riders or whatever, or if I have to stop at lights, my saddle's down, I can reach to the ground without doing my ballerina toes, and I just find it to be a really uh, cool way to be comfortable when having to stop with your bike. Um, so, as I mentioned, we now are moving away from the GRX hoods and uh, lever shifters that we had on the previous models, and we're now into SRAM. For those of you unfamiliar with SRAM's double tap system, I'll just give you a quick rundown. On Shimano, what would happen is you would push this brake lever over sideways, and that's gonna shift you into an easier gear, and you would push this secondary little lever, and that would push your chain the opposite direction. What we have with SRAM, I don't know if it's to be better or just to be different and avoid patents, but we are using the same lever here, and remember we're only looking at a one by drivetrain, so it's just the right doing anything. But this, with the first click, is going to shift our chain down the cassette into a smaller cog or a harder gear. If we push it past that click to the next click, we're then going to be moving our chain in the opposite direction, up the cassette. So still relatively easy, still happening where your fingers are going to be on your uh, shifter anyways. The only downside, and I rode SRAM Force, I think, a number of years ago on a road bike when it was new and I needed to try it. The only thing I found is that um, on drop bars, on, well, on any bike, on climbs that just start to really, really hurt, uh, even when you're 101% sure that you don't have an extra gear to climb into in the back um, to get any easier, I find I'm always just giving one last try to see if I can force one more gear to happen back there. Uh, if you go searching for that last gear and it isn't there in this case, what you'll actually do is drop down to your second easiest gear and then have to climb back up into it. So that is the only knock that I have on this stuff. Otherwise, whether or not a drop bar bike is SRAM or Shimano, I am pretty indifferent. And in this case, because Apex was first to offering this massive gear range without having to do a hack or a bodge or using a mountain derailleur with an access drop bar lever set. Um, these guys were first to the game so they get love on this bike and good on Marin for actually um, keeping their eyes on what was available and not just thinking that this bike has always been a GRX 800 level group set bike and they were willing to switch to get the uh, purchaser the better gear range. Um, going back to controls, one thing that has changed is when we were on the old uh, GRX group set, it was the actual, uh, the equivalent of the shifter over on this side is what was controlling the dropper post. We now have, in this case, this little secondary lever. Uh, I believe that SRAM does a um, left hand dropper post control lever. But what happens, we've seen it on this, we've also seen it on the uh, giant Revolt X's um, that are using, I believe they're on uh, SRAM drivetrains, maybe not. But what happens is, depending on the dropper post design, uh, some of them will have the dead end of the cable at the dropper, some of them will have the dead end of the cable at the lever. Uh, in this case, the dead end is at the dropper, and so you'd have to do some tricky things to get one of these, um, the integrated um, lever shifter, grifter, whatever you want to call it, um, to actually operate your dropper. So um, when you see dead end over here, you will then see uh, the little lever here. It still feels like it's going to be a pretty easy just reach around to, uh, to get that guy to work. Um, while we're here, I'll quickly deploy the dropper. Excuse me for a second. This is such a high-tech channel, hey, when it comes to my editing and all the other sort of stuff. I just want to give you an idea of what the sound of that lever topping out is. I'm using my thumb over on that thing. It's still got that beautiful top out noise. Uh, one of the most gratifying noises in the bike world is a beautiful dropper 
top out noise. So I'm just going to step around, step over some lighting cables here. Um, these things, of course, uh, have a look at the shape of these apex levers. When you put your hands on these hoods here, they provide a really, really comfortable feeling hood. Um, they might have actually won over the GRX, which I was convinced was amongst the best, but this might even feel better from my little bit of test riding, test riding in the store. And then if you look at how fat these, uh, these levers are and just their little bit of profiling and stuff, uh, these feel really, really nice under your fingers. So something to keep in mind, the SRAM stuff is super comfortable. Um, the braking part of these are operating these SRAM hydraulic disc brakes on here. So we're gonna have, I don't think there's gonna be any discernible difference in braking power between this bike and the GRX. I was incredibly impressed by the GRX brakes and I am going to make the assumption now that I will be as impressed with the braking on these guys. We have 160 rotors on here, which is nice to see as opposed to some of the things out there having 140. So you're still gonna have some good powerful braking. These are six bolt rotors, both front and back on here, just in case you're wondering how things are affixed onto here. I'll show you on the front. The front, even though this bike is said to have that 45C Max, if you were riding this like a complete moron and wanted to actually go off-road a little bit more, as many people would know on a mountain bike, um, the heavier tread and bigger tire, if you're gonna have that on either end of your bike, you put it on the front because that's where your uh, cornering traction is gonna be so vital. So if you needed to, I think you could get away with, oh geez, if this is supposed to be 45 max, I'd say you could go up to a 50 on here quite easily and maybe put on a little bit more tread on your front tire once again, if you're gonna be riding like a moron, um, I salute you if you do that. That's not exactly my style. I like to ride these uh, pretty slickish tires and if I'm outside the realm where these can um, handle what I'm riding, then I'll just hop on my mountain bike. But riding like a moron is a super fun thing and I applaud every moron out there. Um, thank you for pushing the limits. I'll just go into a couple more things. So within this bike, there are a pile of different sizes. I believe starting at a 52 and going up to a 60 centimeter with sizing every two centimeters, which is a little bit ridiculous in my mind. I would warn you in sizes like 54 and 56, um, what you get as far as frame geometry with those numbers um, is relatively close, like a 54. In this case here, the horizontal top tube measurement on the sizing chart is actually 54 and a half, so it's certainly close to that 54 name. Um, keep in mind that this is going to have a 70 millimeter stem on it. Uh, once you're up to the 58 and the 60, I believe they go to an 80 millimeter stem, but all the smaller sizes stick with this 70 millimeter, so that having an extra half a centimeter in reach um, compared to some other companies that a 54 would truly be a 54 or maybe a 53 and a half is because all of the bikes are designed around riding a shorter stem than what would be seen on a traditional drop bar bike. And on mine in the 58 that I ride, I will actually, or I do shorten my stem down to 70 rather than the 80. Um, just to make it feel a little bit better for me because their 58 if I remember correctly is actually a 59 and a half um, because of that uh, overall length difference that is made by having an 80 mil stem. It might be 58 and a half. Either way, um, I end up having to shorten my stem to feel good for me and I'm six foot one and I will admit that if it wasn't for stack height at my six foot one height, if it wasn't for stack height I would consider potentially going with a 56. So be open-minded. If you're coming from the purest drop bar road bike world, be open-minded to not having to have quite as much horizontal reach on your bike and also to having to look very deeply into your reach stack effective top tube numbers and how that combines with your stem length and seat tube angle because gravel bikes are starting to push the limits on all of those things just a little bit outside of the traditional road world. So 
Well, I'll also touch on this. A lot of people in the last few months have bought Marins and they are all giving really good feedback on the Marin saddles and that's across the uh, different categories. This to me feels like an extremely um, mushy seat for a relatively high-end uh, gravel bike but I'm going to give it a try because yeah Marin we've actually got a number of people in the shop who have gone out of their way to find uh, Marin OEM saddles to put on their bikes so they are popular. I'll also show you just these handlebars. The handlebar um, width, I believe there's two different widths depending on the size of the bikes. They've got a decent amount of flare, relatively compact drop, um, so keep that in mind. And also relatively compact as far as you don't have a whole bunch of space between where your flats um, corner here, it's a quick corner, and then you only have um, from the center of this to the start of your hoods, it's only about an inch. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about sizing on this as well uh, compared to some of the other handlebar designs out there. Handlebars can make a huge, huge difference as to what your effective reach um, from hands to your ass um, actually feels like. Um, when we're sizing, of course, we're typically sizing with hands in the hoods. So if the bar has a little bit more forward reach before the hoods start, of course, that's affecting your reach in a huge way. So, what does everybody think of this? Hopefully the color is picking up. That is gray at the lighter parts and that is a very dark, um, kind of tealish dark, dark forest teal. I don't know what the heck you call that, but it's darkish green. I know even looking at the Marin website that, that looks like a two-tone gray um, finish. It is not. These decals are all uh, mirrored sort of a finish with a little bit of sort of that uh, um, multi-color reflection depending on what's shining on there. It is a beautiful bike. Everything is beautiful. And last thing I'll leave you with is we had a couple customers last year who were hardcore Cervelo people. She ended up with a Cervelo and when he brought in, she came from a, from a Cervelo bought the headlands trying to get more comfort and the final result was him um, giving a lot of expletives um, because he was so incredibly impressed with the value the ride quality and how comfortable his wife was now on her headlands so do not look at a marin and think these are good in price they must be missing out on something as far as Ride quality, um, Marin just makes darn good stuff. They just don't believe in hosing you. Um, and I respect any company that doesn't want to hose its customers. So with that in mind, thank you, Marin. And that was the 2024 Marin Headlands 2 from Bike Bros in Cochrane, Alberta, Canada.